Hi guys, James Austin Taylor here for Rock Sound. It's another of our video calls. We've been chatting to everybody while we're all at home at the minute, and I'm delighted to say from holding absence, Lucas is on the line. How are you, Lucas? Hello, I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Good stuff, man. Yeah. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. We'll start this off in the way we've started every single one, which to say, of course, I hope you and your loved ones and all your bandmates, everyone, you're all staying safe, staying well. It's a very, very strange time. Um, before we get into music and everything, how have you been occupying your time at home these last few months, man? How's it been going for you? To be honest, it's been kind of weird because we recorded, sorry, to jump straight in with our, our album, but Please we, do. Reco Please we, do. we recorded the record in February. So it was kind of weird because everybody was like, oh yeah, we got loads of time to write music now. And we were all like, we've just literally recorded an album as as close to COVID as possible, two or three days before. So, uh, so it was kind of weird, to be honest, because, you know, we've been slowly writing stuff, but um, I think it's just been nice to just kind of have a bit of stability in life, uh, which is quite a rarity for for most musicians and and you know i think we're all finally out of our overdrafts for the first time ever so i think that's been the, the main positive no um, mean but, feet we like that we like that that's very but, good um, to see. i actually i actually had coronavirus for a while yeah um, so i actually one of the few people i know who who got it so uh it was quite rubbish but um you know i i lived through it and luckily i didn't give it to anyone other than my girlfriend so uh you know <laughs> yeah well no i'm glad you guys you guys are doing okay it's got to be such a surreal surreal experience i'm sure but i'm mm. glad you're kind of recovered now and, and powering through and like you say having music kind of ready to go and release what a lovely situation that is to be in um yeah. let's let's kind of dive into I, I guess my first question is what were the kind of aims going into this record? You know, you set out your stall pretty well with that first record. I know there were then some standalone singles in between. For record number two, it's always a big moment for a band. Yeah, what were you guys sure. thinking and talking about when you first kind of sat down and started piecing together what will become this record? Well, I think, uh, you know, anybody who's followed our band enough will know that we were kind of riddled with lots of lineup issues and, and just lots of little hiccups and even you know if i you know if i was to sit and look at the timeline of holding absence we've tripped up so many times you know obviously the america situation was like a huge thing and now covid and i'm like what the hell else could happen after this you know what i mean so i'm kind of ready for anything but um but yeah so moving on to the second record we just thought to ourselves you know we've got a stable lineup um you know we we know who we want to do the record with. We know where we want to do it. And we just want to do it to the best of our abilities, really. So no more distractions. And I, and I think that was the main thing was being able to write Holden Absence music without any distraction and, and with just pure focus and pure vision. Um, and, you know, I, everybody says it, but it just feels like the best version of this band yet to me. That's nice to hear. Now, that's always a very, very nice statement to have when you're getting into a campaign. That's excellent. Um, so when you were sort of diving into it, I guess I kind of want to start almost before that, because like we say, we had the standalone singles with Gravity and Birdcage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that from the same kind of sessions and stuff, or did you treat that as a separate entity? And I guess, how did those songs inform what's going to be on this record for everybody? Yeah, so uh, those songs were written, you know, we weren't, we didn't set out to write Gravity and Birdcage separately, um, but, you know, they were kind of, Part of part of the writing process for the record, really. But um, we, you know, the, the music industry changes so often, and and as you know, for example, bands like Bring Me the Horizon are very, very open about you know just songs need to be put out. You know what I mean? And like they'll put an album out as well afterwards. You know, but like I think this new kind of singles model, which is hugely adopted by you know trap artists hip-hop artists pop artists it's kind of not being tip, typical of rock and roll man you know we're stubborn and not willing to embrace the future you know and i think um you know with with at the beginning of our career we did a double a side we did a split ep with loathe and we view that as a good way of putting music out without the typical confines of an album um, but at the same time, making it something special. So, you know, you can still hold Gravity and, and Birdcage if you have the vinyl. So it's not like we've just launched this digital song out there. You know what I mean? But at the same time, it kind of stands on its own. And I like to think that, you know, over the, the coming years, I'd love to see more bands do things like double A's or like split EPs and kind of embrace the future of, of music releases, but at the same time, give it a bit of that old school punk rock kind of, real world sensibility so yeah yeah no no it makes sense and it's it's interesting how it definitely felt like 
a step forward for you guys from the debut, sort of taking, almost cherry picking the things that really, really work there and kind of heightening yep. them and shining a light on them. And I presume even, from, I mean, I've heard bits of the record already and it, it definitely feels like you're pushing in that direction again. Still, did working on those songs and putting them out there for fans, how did that push you in the musical direction of what this album is? Yeah, it's a good question because I think it's it's interesting because Beyond Belief, the song we've just put out now, it's, it's not by any stretch... Um, a representation of what the greatest mistake of my life will sound like for the for the vast majority. You know, it's like we've definitely incorporated this kind of more shoegazy kind of the cure esque kind of vibe to our songs. But you know, I, I don't want people thinking Gravity and Birdcage is you know old holding absence and Beyond Belief is like new holding absence and they're a million miles apart because you know they're not. I think for us it was you know we felt like we not truly truly captured what holding absence was to the best version of ourselves like we listen back to like a shadow and there's still little things that you know even the, the our, our band's like shining career moment at, at, as it is now you know we look back and we can see ways of doing it better and i think gravity and birdcage was just the most refined like you know straight to the point version of our band you know uh the choruses were huge the vocals were as crisp as possible the drums were epic you know and and uh and yeah and i think for us it was more about as we left album one behind, Gravity and Birdcage felt very much like the pinnacle of what Holden Absence was for the first 20 songs of our career. So yeah. Yeah, I know it's interesting. You mentioned that with uh, with Beyond Belief, which is of course a single that's out now. And uh, you had a little chat with with my, my good colleague Jack over on the website, which I encourage people to read as well. And there's a great quote in there I picked out just rereading that today, which is you said that track sounds like, like you just said, sounds like if The Cure were a naughty scene band. Yeah, and like, yeah, yeah. that's such a kind of good description. Were they the kind of core influence for that track in particular? Or do you picking out other influences here and there? Where, where did that kind of sit for you? Um, yeah, I think, you know, when, uh, when Scott sent me the demo and when I started writing the vocals, it was very much like the cure was kind of what we were trying to aim for. And obviously we'd never sound like them, you know what I mean? So that's like, that's quite a big thing is, is it's all right to rip a band off as long as you don't sound like you've ripped a band off, you know? Um, and I think for us, it, it sound, it's a whole absence song through and through. It's got the ambience, it's got the atmospherics, it's got this kind of epic intensity but you know with the subtle nuance that the cure bring to their music and and like i said vocally i very consciously put myself in a different kind of place for that song in the same way that robert smith always has it's just this flamboyant uh fluidity you know what i mean it's like words just come out of your body rather than controlling what they sound like when they do you know and i and that was definitely um Something I wanted to do with that track, but the same with the, the whole of the greatest mistake of my life. You know, there's moments where I try and emulate Chino Marino, moments where I try and emulate Gerard Way, and like I said, it's not a bad thing because I don't really sound like any of them. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you've got yeah, you got to wear your influences on your sleeve without ripping them off. I think that's like yeah, every band yeah. wants to do yeah, that. Like, that's yeah, the yeah, balance. For sure. The delicate, yeah. delicate balance there. Um, let's talk briefly as well about visuals before we get into the record because mm. the obvious big difference here we're no longer in black and white we've moved yeah. into color we've stepped into the light here i imagine i mean that's got to be quite a big decision you know you guys have spent yeah, such but... a long time with that as your entire visual aesthetic it was really really ruled if one thing's going to stay the same it's always going to be that uh what prompted the decision to move into color and how is that reflected in the rest of rest of your plans for the record so it's kind of a funny one really because um you know when you spend a lot of time doing something and or, you know, or in, in any shape in life, you know, it's like there's this sense of I wish this could last forever, but I'm very, very glad to be rid of this. You know what I mean? And it's kind of like moving out of some dodgy flat that you're renting off some arsehole landlord. And, and you know, as you close the door, you can you, you still feel this like sense of emotion, but, you know, it's right to move on. And, and for us, it was like that black and white vibe for the first three to four years of our career. You know, it was like we wanted to feel like a timeless band. We wanted to feel like, you know, it could have been a band from the seventies or the sixties, you know, or, it, or it, it didn't matter when we were about, it just mattered that we were a band. And I think that was the, the key thing. But like, as we, uh, as, as we carried on with it, we realized how just stoic and faceless it became. And, um, and as we grew as people and as a band as well, we realized that we weren't this cool, silent, brooding, brooding kind of band that we, 
felt like we were a first, you know, we wanted to show people color. We wanted to show people love. We, you know, and, and I think we had this real cognitive dissonance within our band that we wanted to be warm and, and welcoming, but we looked quite hard and quite cold. Um, and, and I think, you know, what we've, what we've managed to do with this, with this uh, kind of visual side of, of the band now is like, it does look timeless. Again, it could have been taken. Someone asked if the photo was a painting, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, which is, which is perfect because we wanted it to look larger than life and surreal. And um, Beth, our photographer has always knocked it out of the park. And, and this was like a proper, you know, career high for her. I think she's just done some unbelievable work with the artwork. But, um, and I said this to Jack as well. I think what is bigger in life than black and white becoming color. You know what I mean? What is, you know, you, you can see photos from the 1930s or 40s recolored and, and they just look so different and so much more full of life. And, and I just think, you know, with this record, we wanted to feel so much more full of life. We wanted to feel like an evolved, realized version of our prior selves. And, and I just think coming into color finally is, is just, or has been the best way of doing that. Yeah, it's a hell of a statement. It's such a strong visual message to put across there. And I think you're right. I think it is very reflective in the music as well, because we can see that even through something like Gravity and Birdcage right the way through into this latest single and what's to come with the bits that we've heard already. Um, it is more anthemic. There is the, the choruses are bigger, but without sacrificing that style that kind of made you guys. That must have sure. been a conscious decision, right, to really push that particular angle of the band a bit more? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's the same as anything you learn what you're good at while you do it. You know what I mean? And you learn what you're bad at while you do it as well, you know? And, um, and I don't think I'm very, very proud of everything Holden Absence has ever done. I don't feel like we truly missed any shots and, and some fans of our band from back in the day, you know, might cause I, I was saying this to somebody the other day, isn't it mad to think that beyond belief was a shock and like a shadow was a shock, <laughs> you know? And it's like, how have we gone from like a melodic hardcore band with like some, you know, counterparts and being as an ocean as related artists to, to then like, as it is and Creeper. And now we're talking about people relating us to you 2 and, and the killers, you know what I mean? And, and it's like, and it's just always been the goal is to try and do as much as we can whilst being held in absence. Um, and, and yeah, a lot of that is about calculated choice and knowing what to do and what not to do. And, and I think that was really the hardest part of this album, but looking back on it, I think it was maybe our, our greatest strength is we, I feel like we really knew what we were doing this time. Yeah, absolutely. No, there's definitely a, a strong confidence there and very well deserved. And it, again, it comes from just the work over the last few years. You guys have been such a hardworking band. It makes a lot of Cheers, sense man. to me. Um, one thing I have to ask you about the record, it's a question I ask everyone. I, I guess people must get tired. I'm sorry if you're watching this and I've asked this question to everybody, but I'm genuinely interested. Album titles, because album mm. titles to me are always like Dude. mission statements. And yep. this one is provocative, my friend. Mm. I mean, the greatest mistake of my life, you can't get a more black blunt, beautiful statement than that. How did you decide on that being what you think sums up the record? So it has a very special story um, and it's, it makes the album just so much more important to me. Um, but, you know, when we did the debut, we were kind of nine to 10 songs in and we were like, oh, what do we call it? Do we call it in color or do we call it monochrome? Or like, do you get what I mean? Like, and, and, and we basically like, we struggled like hell, you know, and I gotta be honest, like Holden Absence being a self-titled album was as much a failing of, of coming up with a better title than anything. But, you know, the greatest mistake of my life really began um, when when we got the, the debut back and um, I grew up, I, I, if you've read the Rock Sound interview, I'm sorry to <laughs> rehash all this, but uh, yeah, I, I grew up, uh, um, I'd spend all, lots of time over, over my nan's house and um, and she'd have a record player there, you know, and as, as a little boy growing up listening to music and stuff like having this old like vinyl player in the corner, it always felt like this ominous machine, you know, and like as I grew older, then I was like, oh, yeah, that's a record player, you know, and and it all kind of made sense to me that music was always a part of my, my life and a part of my family as well. Um, so when the, the album came out, I give the vinyl to my nan because it just felt like a real full circle thing to do. And she basically alluded to the fact that my uncle was the only other member of the family. My great uncle was the only other member of the family who'd ever had a vinyl. Um, and apparently one day he went and got a recording of himself singing a song. And she flippantly said, oh, you know, the song was called The Greatest Mistake of My Life. And then she kind of said, the greatest mistake of my life was saying goodbye to you. And, and I, dude, I'm just sat in, you know, 
tea in hand, listening to my nan, you know, my favorite person on earth, just say what could literally be a, whole, be a Holden Absence lyric. You know, the greatest mistake of my life was saying goodbye to you. That felt like something I could have written. And that song came out in 1939. And my uncle sung it, you know, decades before I was even alive. And, and it just felt like this really compelling, magical thing. And um, I went home, I looked it up. I realized it was a song made famous by Gracie Fields and, and not many people even really knew about it. You know, there was a YouTube video with like a hundred views and uh, a lyric website that had uploaded the lyrics in 2006, you know what I mean? So really not many people were speaking about this song and, and it just had this like magic to it. And we knew we wanted this timeless feel. And I just thought, what feels more timeless than a lyric I could have written myself being written 80 years ago? And, 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 and being brought to me through like my family, you know what I mean? Not just like life gave it to me, like my own grandmother gave that to me. And like, I know it sounds really pompous, but music is as special as you make it. And, and the moment I kind of heard that title, I just thought, I think that needs to have something to do with Holden Absence. And I mean, Scott chatted about him. We just decided like that should be the name of the, the record. And, and we wrote the record around the title. Um, so yeah oh, wow I hadn't realized that detail you actually wrote the record around the title itself that's mm. very very interesting yeah. how does that work from a from a basic working process then was it just it needed to match a certain mood or how, how does that actually work for you well I tried not to be too rigid this record because the debut obviously was quite a, um, a concept album so I, I kind of forced myself to jump through certain hoops because you know it, it, it needed to all make sense so this album isn't quite so rigid and I'm not so uh confined to doing certain things but basically you know when all you have is a sentence to work off you start psychoanalyzing every word you know so the greatest mistake of my life was saying goodbye to you that says hindsight that says regret that says you know the chasm of life you know this person could be on their deathbed you know it also then it's, it's got this narrative of you is it a love interest is it a best friend and then was it even like, do they even choose to say goodbye to this person? Maybe they were told th the relationship was over and then they had to say goodbye whether they liked it or not. And it just brought this depth of like, you know, and like, for example, Beyond Belief in itself is a song about being scared of love because love leads to forever, you know? And what if you spend forever with somebody and realize that, you know, like, is your hell up above or your heaven below? you know, realizing that you have different opinions, like at the, at the last hurdle, you know, and, and it's just that this whole album is very much about embracing life in spite of death and feeling things and thinking things and just being really candid and hands-on with emotion, basically. And it, it's always been that for Holden Absence, but even now I'm impassioned to speak about it because this, this album just wrote itself for me, really. No, oh, that's amazing to hear. And it's funny how you say like, yeah, that's certainly been a lot of recurring themes in your work throughout the band, but particularly that idea of, you know, not taking life for granted and everything. I mean, the amount mm. of conversations I've had with people over the last few months like this, where we've just suddenly realized that music they'd recorded even prior to the kind of nonsense of this year, like you guys yeah. did, it hits different, man. It must hit different for you after these last few months, right? Well, that's the thing, dude, is like, you know, what, what do we do now? Like, you know, somebody said like, oh, I can't believe they were announcing an album six months in advance. It's like, dude, we're announcing an album six months in advance. We're touring the album six months after, and that might not even happen. So like, I, you know, realistically, what, what can you do? And I, to be honest, dude, I don't want to talk to you about coronavirus. You're sick of it. I'm sick of it. Everybody's sick of hearing about it. I listen to podcasts and I turn them off because they're telling me about how crap it is. I know, dude, you know what I mean? I don't want to be defined by that. And, and I think this album shouldn't be defined by that. And as we, you know, realistically look towards album three now already, because there's nothing else to do, I think to myself, how special music has to be that I can't tour it and I can't put it in people's faces. You know what I mean? Music is, is special, you know, for many different reasons. But I feel like now I'm, I'm realizing for the first time in my life that like the opportunity of wiggling it in somebody's face is not afforded to me as much as it was before. And, and maybe the song needs to wiggle itself. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and I, you know, and, and I just think now I'm, I'm more inspired to write more special, like introspective music, because I realize now that it's a luxury that I can even play music to people, you know?
Yeah, so many people have had those similar realizations, I think, over these last few months. Hopefully, when yeah. things do get back to normal, whatever normal is, I think that's going to be very, very beneficial seeing the way people change and adapt and what they want to put out. And as you alluded yeah. to there, you know, it, again, it seems a ridiculous thing to say, given that this record's still a while out. Are mm. you genuinely thinking about what comes after that? Have you actually started with the ideas? What what kind of stage are you at with that? I've already had lots of... Um, nice little breakthroughs already with album three. So I'm feeling really, you know, even today, you know, um, it's just like, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of at the point now where I, I realize like, I, I don't want to be like a spiritual band or, you know, I'm not, I'm not that dude, but life just is so short. You know what I mean? And, and I'm a musician. So why not make like the best, most introspective, emotional music I can. Um, and this year has really taught me that, you know, I don't know, like songs have not so much saved my life this year, but, you know, having that Shikari record or, you know, the new Biffy record, you know, it's like those are the things that have been getting me through month to month and and like spicing things up a little bit. And I think I need to be conscious of that. You know, it's like music is as important as you make it. So I think I, I really should make it as important as I can. Yeah, very good mantra to have. I definitely respect that, man. Um, <laughs> again, you allude to it. We're hopeful for live plans. We're all hopeful for live plans. <laughs> yeah. I say this to everyone who's announced tours. I want to stay on the positive. So let's <sighs> talk as if it's definitely 100% happening. What an incredible announcement that is. You guys must be so delighted, not only for not having played live in a while, and certainly mm. not this year, but those venues, man. I mean, you must Dude. be very, very hyped for this one in particular, right? I mean, yeah. Like, the thing is, is like, you know, it's, it's a year away. So, like, it doesn't, it won't feel real for a very long time. But, like, seeing those, those venues next to my band's name is just like, just like hysterical, really. It's just the stupidest thing. Like, I can't believe like Brixton, uh, not Brixton, oh my God, Ballroom, sorry. <laughs> Imagine if it was Brixton. Um, but no, like, you know, Ballroom, like Urplast, like some of these venues that I've like grown up seeing my favorite bands on the tour posters of, you know, and it's like, I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it once we've done it. Cause uh, you know, that, there's very much a recurring theme about, the what if of live music at the moment, but just seeing my band's name and those venues on the same poster is just like a real miracle to me. So, yeah. yeah what, I, what I always say as well is cause it was when, uh, when we chatted with Rao from Shikari months and months and months back, I remember he said when, cause the tour had just been announced at the time mm. and he was like, uh, I don't care how many times it has to be rescheduled. I want it in the calendar. Cause I know yeah. it's going to come back and I know it's going to happen. I think that's a very good attitude to have, right? Something to look to like, okay, one day that's coming. Right. Yeah, and I think Rao knows as well as anybody that it's not just him that is looking at that calendar and, no. and you know, letting those boring months plummet into, you know, the abyss. Like, there's, there's thousands of people, you know, who, um, myself included, who were excited at the concept of just being able to see those that Shikari album live or, or you know, any music live, you know. And I think if, if we just lay over and stop announcing to us and, and stop trying, then, like, you know, that's it really. Isn't it? <laughs> you know what I mean? So even if it's the concept of these, these shows is what helps myself and a load of other people get through the next year. That's wicked, man. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more, man. We need it now more than ever. And we need new music more than ever. And congrats mm. <laughs> to you, man. That single is huge. Looking Thank forward you, to the record, man. And uh, yeah, just all the best to you and the lads. And we will see you face to face whenever that is allowed. All right. Someday, someday. <laughs> Can't <laughs> wait, man. Yeah. Good to see you, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. You.